Hi, I'm John Tickles, and welcome to Remote RPGs. Now you may remember that I did a review of the first Lunar game quite a while ago. God, I'm great. However, I was told that the sequel, Lunar Eternal Blue, was even better. Well, this isn't hard to top. Let the image be burned into your retina. Nash's ass. Ha 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 ha. Anyway, Lunar Eternal Blue doesn't feature Nash. Ergo, it must be better. With nothing to do, I'll talk about a game with you. It's one that's not new, but its message still rings true. Lunar Eternal Blue, foo! Why the hell did that need to run? Lunar Eternal Blue, specifically the PS1 version Lunar Eternal Blue Complete, was released by Working Designs in North America in 2000. Like the original, the game was an updated port of the Sega CD version, but unlike how Lunar 1 got a kick-ass PSP remake, Lunar Eternal Blue has gotten... jack shit. Yeah, despite being even stronger than the original in my opinion, this game is absurdly difficult to pick up nowadays without dropping something like 70 bucks plus at the time of this video. It's frustrating, but for now, let's talk about the premise of the game itself. The game is a sequel, taking place many years after the original, though it's still the same world and timeline with some neat references to the mostly beloved characters of the original. However, not all is well, because if it was, why the hell would they make a game about it? The game opens with a mysterious girl awakening alone on a blue star. Now, I don't know how often anybody gets to use this clip, but I won't miss the opportunity. Whoa! Naked blue haired chick! Meanwhile, our brave young protagonist, punnily named Hero, is exploring ruins with his pet flying cat, Ruby, when he soon learns that the mysterious girl from earlier has come to Lunar from the Blue Star in order to stop an ancient evil. Her name is Lucia, and she's a powerful magic being, and Hero, letting his hormones override his sensibilities, agrees to escort her across the world to meet the goddess and save the world. However, their quest is hampered by countless monsters, an army that's convinced Lucia is a celestial destroyer, corrupt authority figures, and three-year-old kids? Oh god, they are screwed. It's a straightforward classic RPG premise. Like the first Lunar, the real strength of the game lies with the characters, so without further ado, Hero is our protagonist, and it's tough to specify him as silent like Alex from the previous game, because he does have more of a character being adventurous, stoic, and determined like 90% of other RPG heroes. Still, classic is classic, and hero is absolutely what you think of when you think of a hero. Like Nal, Ruby is your furry sidekick, except this time, she's a she, and a spunky talking cat thigmajig, who has a not-so-secret crush on the hero. I haven't gone there ever, but... Ruby's love for him is yet another reason I will not visit DeviantArt anytime soon. 
Lucia is our main heroine. Starting the game is an emotionless, robotic creature whose only care is to complete her mission at all costs. Of course, she gets one of those defrosting the ice queen or robot learning how to be human character arcs when she learns about emotions, love, companionship, and that shit. I could complain about how cliche and boring this is, but I won't for two reasons. The first being that this game was one of the creators of this trope rather than a rehasher in my opinion, and the game brilliantly uses the gameplay to reflect this character development, which is a really neat thing that I'll expand upon later. Jean is a dancer, but also a kick-ass martial artist, and most of her attacks suggest that she's a gypsy. Do not try shrink me, Gypsy. I see it is. These are your spells? Oh, she is friggin' awesome in battle. But outside of that, she's a quieter character with a troubled past, though her lack of dialogue does put her back a little bit in terms of being one of my favorites in the game. Still, nothing to complain about, she's still a good character. The award for my favorite character goes to Ronfar, who, simply speaking, is one smooth, funny bastard. He's a gambler and an ex-priest, much like Wolfwood from Trigun. And again, he's hilarious with ridiculously awesome dialogue, he's ridiculously likable, and he has a fantastic backstory and character arc. It's also a nice change of pace to have a male as the healer, and a female as the one that's kicking ass. Lamina is the heir to the Magic Guild, and although she's supposed to mirror Nash, she actually manages to be somewhat likable despite being a frugal chatterbox obsessed with money at the expense of her colleague's sanity. And her thing is putting a mega in front of anything she says. Leo is the aforementioned leader of the world's army, and he gets the most mature storyline in the game, having to decide between his personal moral beliefs and his duties as leader of the organization. Is he a good guy? A bad guy? I know, but I ain't gonna spoil, so play the game and toil. It's not really work like toiling connotes, but royal or soil sounded stupid to rhyme, so yeah. Um, transition? Those are the major characters, but there are obviously some other important people you'll meet along the way. An interesting thing to note is that the sub-villains of the game are actually infinitely more interesting than the actual big bad, which I would say is kind of rare in RPGs. Other than that, without spoiling of course, the characters carry Lunar too. You have to give a crap about what happens to your party for any of the battle or story events to mean anything to you. And that definitely wasn't omitted here. I loved most of the cast of the first Lunar, and this cast is even better, mostly because there's more overall gameplay, thus more time for bonding. The inter-party romances are much less frequent, opening time for character development, and each character gets a specific arc and attention to when they gradually change. This was well implemented, but I think it would have been nice if they let the development happen a little more naturally, rather than characters just announcing that they've changed like they're freaking Care Bears or something, but I guess the cheesiness was somewhat intentional. In terms of the overall story, the game isn't totally impressive. Again, it's more about the characters and their gradual arcs rather than mind-blowing plot events, but there's nothing wrong with that. Furthermore, there are some pretty good plot twists scattered throughout, and the game does take some great turns. Particularly, the start of the second disc was very interesting, although they did try the whole fake out ending thing again on disc 2 of 3. Nice. Speaking of the discs, the game is supposed to span 3 discs, but it actually takes anywhere from 20 to 30 hours to beat, with an additional 10 hours just for the epilogue. Yeah, the game keeps going with a lot of post-game content, and although the true finale is incredibly touching, for once, I have to say that I believe the original, not true ending, is more satisfying, and in my opinion, it's actually better than the true one. It's a good ending, that's all I'm trying to get at, to a very solid story that covers basic, though somewhat overdone messages, but you'll have too much fun along the way to really complain. Speaking of fun, the gameplay in Lunar 2 is very solid RPG gameplay, 
complete with a standard system, though there are enemies you can see on screen, so that's a nice deviation. That and the fact that you look to the left on the battle screen, which is just an OCD thing that bothered me, okay? It should be your guys on the left and the bad guys on the right. It's like when you read a book, left to right. Good on left, bad on right. J don't judge me, it's just weird, okay? Jeez, you're kind of a bitch. Other than that, the only noteworthy thing about the battle system is the fact that you can move around a lot, putting distance between yourself and the enemy, or getting that extra hit. It kind of reminded me of the Grandia battle system, which is definitely a good thing. It's really fun to fight, definitely having a lot of strategy necessary to win the day, but battles never took too long. The game actually gets a little bit harder later on, even when I never ran away from battles, but isn't that just the best feeling? Barely beating a boss with like only one character left, everything on the line. I think so at least. And that's all that matters, goddammit. The only other thing I have to mention about the battles is Lucia. See, you don't control Lucia, she controls herself. Which is annoying, yes, but this member of your team is vital to victory, so she's useful, right? Well, not at first, because Lucia is a selfish bitch early on. She only heals herself, allowing injured party members to die, and only attacks enemies that attack her. This sounds like a pain in the ass, and it is at first, but it's also pretty genius because as the story develops, she gains an emotional connection to her teammates, and then she starts healing others, and she becomes incredibly helpful to the team. She becomes more of a team player along with her story arc. And this was an absolutely amazing way to merge gameplay and story elements, and an example of the nice little details that went into this title. Again, it's the little things, like how even characters that are dead by the end of the battle get XP. Another pretty awesome thing about Eternal Blue that was carried over from its prequel was the fun dialogue. Again, in a manner only mirrored by Earthbound, the townspeople usually have something funny or interesting to say, so unlike a lot of other RPGs, you'll actually be inclined to talk to them just to see what they'll talk about. Even the descriptions for the attacks were pretty entertaining, which is something many RPGs never even pay attention to, really. The character dialogue isn't particularly intricate, but it does show subtlety and attention to detail. Unfortunately, the translation really shows its age sometimes. The Sega CD version was particularly bad for dated references. The game can also be a hair awkward with some of the voice acting, dialogue, and cutscenes, but this is looking back on a game made over a decade ago, so I'll cut it some slack. Another thing I want to mention is how you actually have to be smart with your money in Eternal Blue. You have to keep on your toes by properly budgeting what you buy. Like, what do I really need? What character goes without armor today? You know, the really important decisions that mimic the life an adventurer has. That is, until the end of the game, where you have enough money to buy every Nintendo World Championships cartridge, and then some. The graphics of Lunar Eternal Blue may be its only real weak point. I'm not usually one to harp on a game's graphics, but I can't avoid pointing out that this game came around during the time when Parasite Eve and Final Fantasy whatever was coming out, so I was a little disappointed. In the game's defense, the animated cutscenes were really well drawn and frequent and added to the immersion factor. Lunar Eternal Blue is a remake, so it's staying true to its 16-bit roots, and it's certainly not ugly. I just thought they could have done a lot more with it. Still, it's a good-sized, colorful world that provides the adventure it was promised. True to its predecessor, the music of Lunar Eternal Blue was treated much better with age because this score is still amazing as it was back in the day. The overworld themes in particular are really catchy and memorable, and although the battle themes are a little repetitive, they're still very kick-ass. The game also makes strong uses of musical motifs, much like Chrono Trigger, the Persona series, and Terranigma, which always shows an excellent attention to detail. You've heard it this whole review, so you probably don't need me to tell you that this game has a very good score, which seems to be a staple of working design titles. There is also the aforementioned voice acting, which surprisingly wasn't horrible. 
but not great by any means. I thought a certain villain had extremely hammy voice acting, but I won't spoil, and I wasn't much for the stupid one-liners each character got in the fight, which plagues way too many RPGs. Still, it was a passable job, and a pleasant surprise considering the time period of PS1 voice acting. Sample my goods! Discipline feels good! Ha! You need a spanking! In conclusion, Lunar Eternal Blue is an incredible RPG that definitely has a small dedicated fanbase, but it deserves a lot more attention. Like the first game, it sold poorly, likely because of the extra stuff they threw on, and I'd like to think that I could convince viewers to change this. However, how come the original Lunar gets a GBA remake, a PSP remake, and it's on the Apple App Store, while Eternal Blue doesn't get anything as of mid-2013? It's a better game overall, with a lot more to offer in my humble opinion. The story is solid, the characters, battle system, and music are amazing, and it's just a really great little title. So I'd say pick it up if you have the opportunity, and the cash, because it's an incredible sequel to a series that was finished way too soon in the 21st century. Yes, the very last game in the series for sure. With that being said, I'm John Tickles, and I look forward to our next random encounter.